Um, we are delighted that you're here. Before I start, I've been asked to give a quick reminder to you to add to the Twitterverse of Big Data by tweeting about the event at hash Big Data MSB. I want to give a lot of thank yous to begin with. Um, thank you, Vivek Kandra, for coming down for this. Dean David Thomas will give us your, more on your bio, but let me just say that you, are our you were our absolute first choice as a keynote speaker, and we feel so fortunate to have you here today. I want to thank Provost Bob Groves, who led the country in data collection as director of the Bureau of the Census. I can't think of a better person to serve as our moderator today. Thanks to Satish Slaukin from Deloitte and Lisa Singh from our very own Georgetown Department of Computer Science for serving on the panel. Thanks also to IBM, who's funding today's conference, and particularly to Stephen Miller, who came all the way from Portland to serve on our panel, and Frank Stein, who has shown himself to be a real friend to Georgetown by coming and teaching our students about analytics almost every time one of us in the open faculty um, asked him. So we really appreciate that, Frank. Um, special thanks also to Penelope. Penelope's been supportive throughout all the planning for this. Thank you, Penelope. Um, I also want to thank a very special group of people who have helped me teach about big data in my undergraduate database class and who are helping me design an intensive learning experience for MBAs this summer. I hope that we can use what we're learning as well to do some executive and custom education um, here as well. The excitement that we've shared throughout this project has been energizing. Thank you, Bill Garr, Rob Pontesapan, and Marie Selvanandan from Candles. And I also see good Candles friends over there. Um, Candles is a wonderful center for new designs in learning and scholarship that helps we professors with almost any new technology we want to get into and learn about. And we so appreciate them being here. Thanks to Greg Marsh, my, one of our MBAs and my graduate assistant. And a special thanks, Kristen, would you stand up, to Kristen Bolin, another MBA student and a GA who has helped with so many details for this conference. I could not have done it without you, Kristen. Thanks also to Chris Cormus, Teresa Mannix, Tara Miller, Patrick Burrett, Julia Newton, and Matt Lewis for helping with all the communications and social media details. Thanks also to Andrea, Andrea Salvatore and Elizabeth Chavez for sharing their experience with us. Well, folks, who would have thought many of us are statisticians or used to be statisticians or are interested in statistics? Who would have thought we'd see headlines which read, which read, data crunchers, now the cool kids on campus in the Wall Street Journal? Or data scientist, the sexiest job of the 21st century in the Harvard Business Review? Is it all hype or is it real? Well, let's consider a few things. Of course, it's a data deluge. 2009, for example, is estimated to have had more data developed than all the data up until that year. Second, this will only continue. We know we're getting more data. We know we're getting it faster and faster. It's coming from structured and semi-structured data. And we were just talking at our table about how is there really any unstructured data out there. Um, but what's called, there is, there is data that's called unstructured data. Um, this comes from Twitter, Google, Facebook, um, smartphone apps, and the famous Internet of Things, just to mention a few. The Internet of Things includes all kinds of appliances that will send data directly to the Internet. Imagine if you're worried about an elderly parent um, not eating. You'll be able to tap into online data about how many times they opened the refrigerator that week. Um, or imagine a sensor the size of a grain of sand coursing through your blood our blo bloodstreams, pouring constant data about you and your health 
into um, the internet. Um, hopefully there's some good privacy uh, <laughs> um, technology in, in play there. Even people's clothes are, are generating data. Right now, soccer teams in the UK and the US are using uniforms with embedded sensors to keep track of things like heart rate, position on the field, and other data. Sensors are communicating location, movement, temperature, um, vibrations, even chemical changes in the air. Third, the technology to deal with all this data has gotten a whole lot better. And technology is really what makes analysis of big data possible, isn't it? Now, of course, many of us could make the case that we've been using big data for decades. And then on, to the contrary, you could make the case that really um, this is a field that's just broken open because of the addition of technologies like Hadoop, Hive, HBase, to name a few newer technologies. There are others that continue to be developed as we speak. Most importantly for us, though, here today, these technologies can analyze huge new databases rapidly and inexpensively, or relatively inexpensively. Fourth, companies like IBM and Microsoft, which was recently featured in the Chronicle of Higher Ed with their Daytona project, and others um, with the equipment to run this technology are making it easier and easier for academics like us to get hands on and teach about big data. And fortunately for professors, the speed and ease with which we'll be able to do so will increase rapidly in the years ahead. Fifth, we know from polls that leaders in every industry and almost every organization in this country um, want to use big data to make better decisions. MIT found, of course, that the best performing companies use big data analytics. Six, the U.S. is going to need to have more people to fill the jobs requiring an understanding of big data and how to work with it. The consulting firm McKinsey estimates, and I quote, by 2018, the United States alone could face a shortage of 140,000 to 180,000 people with deep analytical skills, as well as 1.5 million managers and analysts with the know-how to use the analysis of big data to make effective decisions. And note that that's just a prediction for the U.S., never mind the global need for data analysts. All right, so seven and last. Today, we're not going to just talk about what big data is, not just what it can do, or what privacy concerns there may be. Those have been discussed and will continue to be discussed at numerous other conferences. Instead, we're here today as professors and business leaders to talk about a responsibility to educate our young people to make use of big data. Students are going to need to know how to use big data in a way that will make it come alive through data visualization, simulations, text analytics, voice analytics, social media analytics, data mining. I'm sure I've left something out. but and other techniques that will help predict and prescribe for the future, shortening the time it will take to get value out of data by making decisions that will pay off. We have some exciting things to talk about today. Right now, I'm delighted to introduce you to our dean at the Medina School of Business, David Thomas. David has been here almost two years now, and we are very grateful for his support and encouragement. David? Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you all here to the McDonough School of Business. Um, I'd like to start by thanking IBM, uh, our partner uh, in encouraging uh, this event and helping to bring it about today. Also, to acknowledge and thank uh, the other companies that are participating with us today and are represented here, Deloitte, MicroStrategy, IBM, and Salesforce. Uh, for, 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 being, uh, for being with us. Um, Betsy described the world that we are moving into that poses many challenges as well as opportunities. And one of the things that um, I talk about uh, as part of my vision for the McDonough School of Business 
is that uh, we will be one of, the pre one of the preeminent institutions in the world creating knowledge and educating leaders to address the most significant challenges and opportunities facing so business and society. Uh, and <clears throat> you don't need to uh, look very far to understand that the realities that Betsy was describing, that world that now gets captured by this metaphor of big data, uh, is, represents uh, some of those significant challenges and opportunities that are going to be facing society. It's also clear to me that it is convenings like this that create the possibility that that world will actually become a better world than the one that we exist in, but it will require individuals prepared to address and take advantage of those challenges and opportunities that are presented. And it's clear that to do that, to, to, to create a set of leaders prepared for that future, you have to bring together the kind of group that's represented here in this room. Practitioners, academics, people who understand the past very well, but also those of you who will inherit the future and have to lead in it. So uh, I think this room uh, has, represents the potential uh, for us to move uh, this society forward given these realities of big data. A little later, um, we will hear from a panel of distinguished experts in this area. Uh, that panel will be moderated by Professor Robert, uh, Provost Robert Groves uh, here, here at the Georgetown University, who, as Betsy mentioned, uh, had charge of one of the largest uh, data centers uh, uh, in the world, the U.S. Census Bureau, for a number of years. But before we move to the panel, we have the opportunity to hear from our key, keynote speaker, Vivek Kundra, uh, <clears throat> who undoubtedly is one of the premier experts in this field. Uh, he was chosen by President Barack Obama to serve as the first Chief Information Officer of the United States. One of the first projects Vivek undertook in his post as CIO was to launch data.gov a web portal that increases the ability of the public to easily find, download, and use data sets that are generated and held by the government. Prior to joining the Obama administration, Vivek served as the Chief Technology Officer for the District of Columbia and as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Technology for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Vivek also served as a fellow at Harvard University at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society and the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. His career achievements include being honored as the 2011 Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum. In the same year, he was recognized as the Government Executive of the Year by Tech America. He was also in 2009 named Chief of the Year by Information Week. And a year earlier, Vivek was recognized as the 2008 IT Executive of the Year for his pioneering work to drive transparency, engage citizens, and lower the cost of government operations. He's a member of the, of the Council on Foreign Relations and now serves as Executive Vice President for Emerging Markets at Salesforce.com. Um, I think we could have no better representative of what the future holds and what leadership for that future looks like than Babik Kandra. Please join me in welcoming him. Good afternoon, and Dean, thank you for that very kind introduction. What I thought I would do is actually share with you a story of uh, what the future of big data looks like around the world. Last night, I came back from Haiti. As many of you know, Haiti was devastated by an earthquake, and they're on a long road to recovery uh, that's going to take many, many years. The unemployment rate in Haiti is about 85%. The education rate coming out of high school is under 25%. And the prime minister and his cabinet are working very, very hard to figure out how they spur economic growth, how do they make sure that education is at the center of their growth story. 
And how do they make sure that uh, as they're laying this new foundation, that uh, they're doing so in the context of what's going on in the global economy? As I sat down um, with many of the leaders um, within the Haitian government, what was really clear was they realized that their future is tied to how they actually use technology. Because in the last five years, what they've seen is when it comes to the mobile internet, that out of 10 million people in Haiti, 6.5 million people have a cell phone. And what was fascinating, as I was walking down the streets, you could see street vendors who were selling, whether it was potatoes or fruits, using cell phones to manage their supply chain in terms of being able to say, hey, we're really selling out of you know, these potatoes. Please get more so we can move this in terms of the local economy. And what's fascinating was also to watch them actually collaborating, communicating, generating more data than you could imagine, taking pictures. Now, think about this at a global scale with seven billion people on the planet and about five billion mobile devices. Every individual essentially becomes a sensor for the planet where you can instrument emotions, people's feelings when it comes to their dreams, their grievances, and at the same time, all this data that's being generated in unprecedented ways. We live in a world where we haven't been able to fully grasp the impact of what's happening with that data. We talk a lot about the data that's within enterprises or governments, but we really haven't fully understood what is being unleashed at the macro scale. Now, in 2007, I had the opportunity um, to work for Governor Tim Kaine, who was very, very interested in a policy objective, which was to accelerate um, how the government was spending money when it comes to small women and minority businesses. And his goal was, you know, 40 percent of discretionary spending should go to small women and minority businesses. Yet, the old model was that you would trust each cabinet secretary to go out there, fill out some random report, and hope good things happen. What we did is we launched this thing called the SWAM dashboard, and essentially told every cabinet secretary and their staff that they no longer needed to submit any report whatsoever, that we were going to go directly to GE, who held the contract uh, for all the credit cards that the state of Virginia had. And we would take all that data and uh, slice and dice and cube it under each cabinet secretary's name. And we would take all the data from our central procurement system and create a composite image of what was happening in each of those um, uh, cabinet secretariats. And very quickly, what we saw was cabinet agencies you know, starting to say, well, wait a second, what's wrong with this data? I'm not sure this is accurate. And the procurement spend at that time was, um, I believe, under 18%. And by the time the governor left, it was over 40%, because he used that data to drive the administration, bringing in cabinet sectors who were not performing, and making sure that it was advancing a policy objective. That was a very, very powerful experience from my perspective, because I realized the power of data in terms of public policy. So when I went to the District of Columbia as a CTO, one of the first things we did is we said, you know, the D.C. government has all sorts of data that's just locked up in its warehouse. Why don't we free it? Why don't we open it up? And what we decided to do was take data on everything from crime to procurement to data on health care to permitting and literally expose all of that data. Part of it was to make sure that we were able to effectively fight corruption, make sure that we were allowing citizens to become watchdogs, and also creating an ecosystem of innovators. By releasing all this data, there was a lot of pushback, obviously, because government officials wanted to hold on to that data. And there are all sorts of cases that were being made for why that data should be private and not public. But by unleashing all this data, entrepreneurs in DC started developing really interesting apps because I launched this competition called Apps for Democracy. And it was only for $50,000. It 
and we challenged entrepreneurs from around the District of Columbia and the country to develop game-changing applications for the city. In 30 days, there are over 40 apps that were developed. Um, one of the apps actually allowed you to see, based on where you're physically standing, uh, all your transportation options. Metro trains coming in both directions, uh, what was available in terms of buses and so forth. And we started seeing some amazing adoption when it came to that app. We started seeing somebody who developed an application that allowed permitting and licensing. So you could actually see how effective the government itself was being in terms of its performance, uh, what the wait times were to get a permit uh, to build, whether it was a deck or any home improvement project. And you could also see from a procurement perspective, which had historically been a persistent problem in the DC government, you could actually see the government official who made the award and the company that actually received the award so you could start seeing relationships between money being spent and who was actually spending that money. And that led to a fundamental reform around the procurement system. So when I had the opportunity to serve in the White House, one of the first acts you know, consistent with the president's philosophy of a more open, transparent, and participatory government was to actually unleash all this data that the government had locked up. Just think about two public policy decisions that have changed the course of the nation and the world for that matter. Number one was in the Reagan administration where satellite data was held as a national security secret essentially because it was initially designed for precision guided missiles. But it was made available, you essentially gave birth to an entire new industry, the GPS industry, to where I could navigate a new city and find the closest pizza parlor or coffee shop. The second big public policy decision was around the Human Genome Project. The NIH, working with other world bodies, decided to make that open. And all of a sudden, you had this race to the top where scientists from around the world were collaborating and focusing on personalized medicine and developing breakthrough drugs and technologies when it comes to the healthcare field. In the same way, I think the vast array of data that the public sector has needs to be open, it needs to be out there, obviously weighing you know, the consequences when it comes to privacy and national security, but the default should be a more open, transparent, and participatory government rather than what we've had historically, which has been a closed, secretive, and opaque government. And the reason I think that's really, really important is because the first time we have an opportunity to actually realize what I've been calling the digital public square. It used to be that in the Agora, you needed to go to a physical public square to conduct commerce, to petition your government, to socialize. Now all of a sudden, with access to a computer or a mobile smartphone, you're able to participate and conduct commerce in ways that were just structurally impossible in the past. And what's super exciting about this is also the ability to actually think about the economy in the 21st century. When we launched data.gov, we had 47 data sets. Today, we've got over 400,000 data sets on every aspect of government operations, from healthcare to the environment to education. You know, one entrepreneur actually built a company called Brightscope using Department of Labor data and uh, creating a comparative effectiveness platform for 401k plans. And he's making a fortune as a result of that. Another entrepreneur took data that we had put out there in the public domain from CMS, Medicare, Medicaid data, where you could actually see before you checked into a hospital what the mortality rate of that hospital is. You could actually see how the doctors and the nurses are rated, and you could also see the cost for that procedure and compare it nationally. Another person developed an application that took data that comes out of the Consumer uh, Protection Safety Commission, which actually tracks all the accidents that have happened in emergency uh, as a result of toys um, and people who have been admitted to emergency rooms and the causes of that, and built a really simple iPhone app that allows an expecting mother who's walking down an aisle that's about to buy a crib, she can scan it and see whether that's been recalled or not. 
And what I realized was that's not what the agency actually worries about. What they worry about are the products that have already been bought. So in the same way, you know, making sure that you can actually scan on a regular basis products that you own to see whether they've been recalled or not. In Brazil, you know, data was used um, to expose corruption in terms of elections, and a number of politicians had to resign because they could see the correlation between government contracts, contributions, and being elected to office. In Haiti, one of the gentlemen that I spoke to talked about how they took very simple data, not very, very sophisticated, but simple data around polls where you could see the number of people that were registered versus the votes that actually had an impact on the election itself. That's one part of the impact that I think big data is going to have. Another area is actually thinking about how our very society is going to be transformed and what the future is going to look like. Think about the financial crisis and the regulatory regime, right? Because I think when it comes to big data now, what's going to be supreme is algorithms. And people who are going to be working on developing those algorithms, separating noise from signal. Think about the vast amount of data that's being generated. It's very, very easy to just get lost and get excited about the data that's being collected and build massive warehouses. But more important than that, is the insights that you're deriving from the data that's being collected and the timing. You want an insight on a real-time basis, not a day ago, not three days ago. And what you're going to see now is this confluence of sort of machine-human interfaces uh, that represent the future. So regulations. Could you imagine a world where you have algorithmically driven regulations? Because if you look at our very legal structure, a very system by which we govern nations, it's focused on hardwiring a set of assumptions. What if you had a model where your regulatory framework would adjust to what's happening on the ground so, so that you didn't have to actually sign a law and wait 10, 20, 30 years before that law was being changed? I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see what the future holds there. Think about you know, the future of business and how whether you're a university or you're a startup or you're a multinational corporation, how do you actually fundamentally redefine the relationship with the customer, the way you connect to your customers, the way you connect to your employees, and the way you connect to your products? All of a sudden, you have the opportunity to deliver an extremely personalized experience that you just couldn't in the past. So GE, for example, is using big data uh, to track data that's coming out of their jet engines to be able to see, you know, in terms of the sensors, what the temperature on those engines are, any issues, and they're building communities around those engines using social networks to be able to troubleshoot those problems collaborative on a real-time basis. Uh, you're looking at some really, really interesting things in our broader economy as you're seeing the reinvention of everything from a thermostat that you see in this room where a company like Nest is doing some really, really exciting stuff where they'll actually tell you, you know, the temperature in this room, allow you to control it with your mobile device, but also give you the average temperature of your zip code and around the country and compare your usage of energy with every, everyone else around the country and give you very specific, actionable things you can do to change your energy consumption. Think about you know, organizations like Uber um, you know, that are fundamentally redefining personalized transportation, where based on where you're standing, they've got algorithms with drivers who are coming into a market they normally wouldn't have been into and are able to, uh, using GPS signals and using kind of analytics, figure out how do they provide you the best customer service and get it to you as close to real time as humanly possible. So I am super excited about where we're headed when it comes to big data, when it comes to fundamentally redefining government, fundamentally redefining entire sectors of the economy, and most importantly, allowing us to have a much more customized, 
personable experience, whether it's with, with your government or as a customer. And when you look at uh, some of the algorithms that are being developed, I think this is where the business school has a unique opportunity, uh, not just to think about uh, data scientists, which is inevitably going to be necessary when you think about the human supply chain of having people who can actually not just slice and dice and cube data with machines, because I think more and more of that is gonna be automated, but actually how do you provide deep insights and correlations that are at global scale, not limiting it to just local context. But the other thing that I think is gonna be really, really exciting is the opportunity for entrepreneurs. The next billion dollar companies are going to be built on top of this open data movement. So since we started data.gov, we've seen its proliferation from cities, you know, whether it's New York City or San Francisco to countries from the UK to Australia to Canada to Mexico. And what's super exciting about all of that is they're making that data available for free in an open machine readable format that allows us to create the next generation of companies, but also to hold our government accountable. So thank you very much for having me. I'm super excited about uh, the panel uh, and uh, looking forward to a healthy debate as we move forward on the, this next frontier of innovation. Okay, I'd like to invite the panelists up here, and you can see where you're going to sit. Um, we have as our moderator, as I mentioned, uh, Provost Robert Groves, Bob Groves, then uh, from uh, Deloitte, Satish Lalkand. I've had Satish uh, speak in, in my class, and, and I'm really happy he's here today. Steve Miller coming all the way from Portland to, um, he's with IBM, and then Lisa Singh, in the Department of Computer Science here at Georgetown, and Frank Stein, also from IBM. I'll turn it over to you, Bob. Thank Great. you. So those of you who know Betsy know that this is an orchestrated panel. <laughs> and my job which is the job that the provost often gets, is to sort of watch real things happen and stimulate smart people to say things. So we at Georgetown are all about uh, changing the world, and we change the world through shaping young minds that identify the problems of the world and then goes off, uh, go off and solve them. So a lot of the questions I'm gonna pose to the panel have that flavor. And I think what we'll do is just kind of go down the, uh, the panel, and if you want to say something on a question, say it. If you want to pass, that's fine, uh, if that's okay. And let me launch you with, uh, with the observation that's already been made that uh, I think Hal Varian at Google first said that data scientists are gonna be the sexiest job uh, for the next 10 years. I don't know why he limited it to, to, to 10 years, that seems. <laughs> uh, and so the question for a place like Georgetown is, how do we get our students prepared to look out for those opportunities to, uh, how do we instill in them the desire to see the opportunities in, in such a field? And then more fundamentally, how do we structure curricula and course opportunities that get them prepared for that? So that's question number one. Satish? Great. Um, so, uh, you know, when I started 14 years ago, I went down a path in a different field altogether. And I'd say I now lead the analytics practice for Deloitte in investigations and compliance. Um, and in, in school itself, like all of you, I made that decision to get into analytics and it was primarily through professors, mentors, and hearing external speakers and learning about those opportunities. So I think that's very important in, in an academic sense because it's always good to be very well connected to the business community, to the world, to know what's going out there, what, I mean, in fact, sessions like these, you know, to get to learn more about communities, um, various organizations, big data concepts. So definitely attending events, um, getting guest speakers into the school, 
um, also being um, promoting competition internally. You know, get students excited to come up with a competition on big data, perhaps, and solving challenges. I think those could help certainly um, get students more interested and also learn a lot more. Steve. Yeah, I'm going to take a little bit different spin on it. So I'm just going to go to the undergrad level, regardless of what program you're studying. Doesn't matter. Every junior should have a course of, in analytics literacy. Every single one. And I know that's hard work, because that's going to require going to accreditation boards and making them open their, this into the, as one of the things that they allow. And then when you get to the senior level, you need to have an analytics course tied to the actual field you're studying. And in some fields, you can argue the importance of it. I think it's applicable to everyone, whether it's political science, whether it's bio, whether it's chem, whether everything. Everybody needs to be able to take what they've learned about a core analytics literacy and then start knowing how to apply it to their field. And that's all before you start getting to the postgrad study of becoming a, a, a data scientist. Lisa. Uh, so I, I view, um, I view this topic as very interdisciplinary. And I think if I was in the business school curriculum, one of the things I would want to do is to start out with a very projects-based course. Um, this course would be one that uh, had some large data sets associated with this. And this data could be anywhere from any discipline. Taking those data sets and then finding a way to access the data, so starting out with um, a database overview, starting out with learning how to work with big data in the context of Hadoop or MapReduce. I think you could have a module just based on that. Then you do the next step where you do a surface view of the types of topics that are in data mining, um, statistics, to develop certain type of descriptive and predictive models. Just to understand what this concept even means before you do anything that's really, really intense. And then finally, um, as we've heard a few people say, you have to be able to pick out what's important after you've built these models and you've applied them to the data. You have to understand what your results mean. So whether that's through visual analytics or whether that's through some other form of disseminate of, um, of aggregation of the data, that would be the last piece. So if you looked at the entire life cycle of, uh, of a big data process that would be what I would want one course to be. And I think it is really, really important to incorporate that into every curriculum, even besides business, as you were saying. Frank. Uh, well, I'll, <laughs> I'll agree with uh, the, the rest of the panel here. Uh, I've got two kids in college. Uh, my daughter is or was an anthropology major. Uh, anybody here that's uh, math phobic and uh, would prefer not to play with numbers? Nobody in this audience, <laughs> nobody in this but, audience that wants to admit it, I believe. Yeah, there's right? a lot of social pressure here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I believe that every field is going to become much more quantitative than where we've been in the past. Even fields like anthropology are, are getting much more quantitative. Uh, there's a number of people that are actually, uh, you know, doing great work around uh, genetics and anthropology. Uh, and, uh, you know, how can we understand uh, anthropology through the genetic makeup? So I think that what we've got to do is get to the point that we're not thinking of analytics as a separate field. Analytics is a tool, it's a capability. Big data is a tool and a capability that needs to be embedded into all the curriculum, whether it's something like uh, anthropology and, and more of the liberal arts or whether it's in business. Uh, or whether it's in the sciences and, and the hardcore uh, kind of curriculum. And then the question is, of course, how do we do that? And how do we incorporate that into the program? And we have faculty that probably aren't that comfortable. Uh, you know, an anthropology professor probably is not that comfortable using data and data analytics. But all the fields are going to be changing, and we really have to figure out how we're going to start incorporating data and data analytics into these fields, because that's the way the future is going. So let me, let me probe the question, and I'll start with you, Frank, since you had to wait and kind of find what, what people didn't say before you. Um, so do you see the world in the future from, from the university side, the desirable world, is one where there are programs that are 
integrated sets of courses that did give degrees in analytics or data science or whatever you want to call this field? Or do you believe the steady state will be uh, uh, students going across disciplines, picking up these courses as part of uh, some focus they have? What, what's your view of the needed future on this? So if I look at IBM and, and who and what kind of hiring we're doing, and I did just before I came over here, I noticed that we had about 1,200 job openings under the title of analytics. Now some of those job openings are computer science type people that Lisa, you know, would, could be teaching. Uh, so they're sort of hardcore, you know, of actually building the systems. There's other people that are more of the data analysis kind of people. They'll be consulting with others. But we also have a large need for people that have the capabilities to use data and data analytics in all sorts of different fields. So I, I pulled up uh, you know, one of the listings uh, here, uh, and it was all about natural resources. So you had to have a geoscientist kind of background, but you also need to have the data and data analytics. The job posting actually required analytics as part of the skills needed to do that piece of work. So it's a combination of the domain knowledge and the skill knowledge that goes across it. Lisa. Yeah, so I think uh, I've worked with a lot of different types of data over the years, and I think there is something inherently very specific about different data sets. Um, those data sets that may come from the English department and are more literary versus those data sets that come from the biology department, maybe more structured or more, more observational scientific data sets, they have very fundamentally different properties. And while there is a broad analysis methodology that I think spans them, I think there are a lot of details that are very specific to the different disciplines. Um, so I would be hesitant to say that I think um, we should definitely have a data science program with graduates as much, I, I think I would prefer to say that data science is something that's necessary across a lot of different disciplines and that can be integrated within different curriculums in slightly different ways. Yeah, so in my previous answer, I talked about the undergrad issue where I think it's a fundamental literacy issue. But when we get to the postgrad side, I think there's uh, lots of different dimensions. And there is an absolute need for very specialized degrees in building these really deep data scientist skill sets that you're not going to get at, through literacy. And the number of things you have to bring together in a two-year program is really quite daunting for a lot of schools. And it's going to be almost impossible for most schools to do that within the framework of a specific school. It's going to be partnership across the university to bring all of the different things together. Math and stats, comp sci and machine learning, business and looking at how they look at applying business decisions with data. And I'm mean just, yeah, just really touching the surface. And also communications is really important. How am I going to visualize this, right? How am I going to make any sense in a way that I can communicate this to other people? And when you bring all of that together, it really ends up being a true cross-organization. And there isn't a, a good example out there at North Carolina State with uh, Michael Rappaport's program, but it's, it sits outside of all the schools and pulls people together. And I think that's a model that others could be looking at borrowing from and how can we tailor it to our school and what our strengths are. Sure, and you know, certainly the aspects of having somebody deep into technology and analytics, the data scientists, it's also important to have a you know, the strong educational background if you're gonna do geology or if you're gonna have some, uh, you know, a strong business educational background. But another aspect that we find very important, particularly at Deloitte is, and in particularly if people are going, getting into like a consulting business, is having that industry aspect. Like for instance, financial services, you know, if you're going to be doing work, say, perhaps in the banking sector, you know, it's trying to understand what are the issues going on in that industry? What are the challenges? Because it, it varies from industry to industry. I can have somebody who's got a very strong computer science and math background who is a data scientist, but focuses on a totally different set of problems in either the telecom space or when serving some of our clients, perhaps on Wall Street. So having that industry perspective is also very important. This actually leads me to the, the next question. We, we all have read 
about firms that are specializing in data analytics as a, as a, as a business model. But if I were a young person preparing for a career uh, in the world, should I aim at those as where I end up, or will this become so ubiquitous that I, I shouldn't, uh, I should uh, sort of hedge my bets or prepare myself for multiple domains where analytics could be done? And, and what are the firms, how do you identify a firm that has turned the corner on analytics? Sure. So, so if I look to, you know, my own firm, looking out over the next 10 years, analytics is part of our key strategy. And we have done, we've made great progress, but also, you know, businesses continue to embed analytics into every aspect of them do, doing business. There still is a long way to go. And, you know, I'm sure most of us have been around for some time. Um, you know, in the professional space, you you do continue to reinvent yourself. Businesses do change also. So to say, you know, will analytics look the same 25 years from today as it does today? Probably not. You know, we've got, just looking at the iPhone itself, you know, who knew what would have come out perhaps a decade ago. But, you know, certainly reinventing yourself would be important, but the education has to be continuous, you know. Uh, since, particularly since we're talking about in this space, you learn about analytics. And I continue to learn every day, keeping up with innovation, learning new technologies, and also continuing to grow. And that's why, you know, tying into educational institutions, even partnering from a business standpoint, it's this back and forth where, you know, it's this continuous cycle. Yeah, I think uh, even thinking more broadly, if you think about the average student and what path you're going to go, right? You don't necessarily have to say, I want to have a career in, in deep analytics. But in thinking about, like he was talked about during the keynote, about open data or data in general as a differentiator for business. For almost anything that you're interested in, whether you want to be a brew beer as a career, you're going to be using data. And you can find new ways to differentiate the business that you're in by using data in creative and fresh ways. So I think that whole idea of of data, and I'll borrow from my CEO's speech a few weeks ago at the Council of Foreign Relations. She says data is the next natural resource. And if you think about data and in, in step back and really think about what data can do, I think it really does change where you might take your career. And whether you choose to be uh, a data scientist or not, you know, thinking about this differently and applying it to your career path and your passions will open doors for you. So when I was uh, an undergrad in college, I, I actually had no idea what I was going to do. Um, I actually have an English electrical engineering undergraduate degree to tell you how far <laughs> I've come. Such a common combo. Yeah, such a common <laughs> conversation, <laughs> right. Uh, and so I think what I did gain from my undergraduate degree were tools and thinking processes and ways to look at not only data but different types of problems. And I guess one of the more common um, jobs that one could get with these types of skills outside of going straight into engineering was something like a business analyst. And I imagine now, today, in today's economy, what was the common business analyst will actually be the data analyst, the data engineer, the data scientist. Um, I believe that this is going to be an everyday type of job that everybody, every company needs, and that every company, whether it's for um, to build a business around, or whether it's for analyzing their own data to get a competitive advantage, I think that most companies um, will have a position that looks very much like this. So students who are gaining these skills will be able to very, will be very marketable. In fact, probably more so than a traditional business analyst, in my view. Sorry, I know I'm at business school, but um, <laughs> So I think the way you need to think about this is that the problem, the question, is still what matters. The, I was talking to the dean uh, at lunch, and it's the things like data and, and data analysis and the systems that we build are helping to answer questions. But you have to be smart. You have to understand what questions to ask. If you're Procter and Gamble and you ask the wrong questions, no matter how good the analytics, no matter how good the data, you're not going to get what you need. 
if you're the Census Bureau, uh, you need to understand the data, but you have to understand what am I trying to get out of this data? What are the insights that I'm trying to learn? Uh, if you're a geoscience person, you need to, the same kind of thing. You need to have enough grounding and enough understanding because it's not about the data. It's about what the insight is that you're trying to get from the data. It's what's the question and how do I answer the question? We now have a lot more ways to answer questions than we did before. There you, we, IBM, published a thing that said that about 80% of decisions made in business were based upon gut decision making. In the medical community, we have similar statistics that say that doctors in over half the time that it, they make decisions, it's based upon what they believe rather than data-driven decision making. Now, do you want to go to a doctor that is not basing it on uh, data and, and real knowledge, or do you, you know, or do you rather have a doctor that, you know, is basing his diagnosis and treatment plan based upon real data? But of course, it's about does the doctor understand enough about your symptoms and know the right questions to ask of the data? And that requires a lot of knowledge beyond just the data tools and the data analytics that we're talking about. The uh, <clears throat> CEO of Time Warner famously said at one point that uh, the most precious executive resource to him are, are those uh, uh, vice presidents who know the right questions to ask. He, he says, once we have the questions, there are tons of people that can provide the answers, but it's getting the questions right that uh, is the key thing. Great. Let me, um, since this is such a rapidly moving field, and universities are not known for moving at uh, rapid rates, it seems like a moment in history where alliances between industry and academia makes sense. And I, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on what models you've seen out there that really can pass on to the next generation as fast as possible these kind of skills to fill the needs that our society have on this, and whether there are some things that uh, merit consideration. So, Frank, can I give you that? Sure. Uh, well, I would make it a, uh, a stool with three legs. Uh, and the first leg is obviously the academics, and the second one is industry, as you mentioned. And I think there's a role for government as well. So I would add government. Uh, and for example, uh, you know, OMB and, and the government, uh, actually the Office of Science uh, Technology Policy, uh, has sponsored data paloozas. And this is, you know, an effort to get, to have the government sort of evangelize and bring together uh, those people in industry and those people in academic uh, community to, to work together. Uh, we particularly need this right now because we in industry need more skills, more capabilities. Uh, but on the other hand, academia isn't always aware of what industry needs or the direction that we're going. Uh, so, you know, Betsy is, is just a fantastic example, uh, you know, in, in the entire community uh, because of the way she's done this outreach to industry to say, help us understand your needs, help us to set the direction where do you need to go and, you know, tell us, you know, how we can help uh, build this bridge uh, between the academics and the uh, industry. Uh, so this is always a tricky slope for an academic because you always want to think of academia as pure and we have these concepts we teach that transcend what you want in industry. But from a practical standpoint in computer science, particularly in data mining and, and some of the more modeling um, disciplines, I think there would be nice partnerships and synergies that could be made between um, different faculty and businesses that would be willing to kind of share large, large data sets as well as large, uh, um, not only the data sets, but some of the technologies that they're using um, to analyze the data, to understand the data, to improve the quality of the data, to um, gain access to the data. Some of that would be really, really useful. So as computer scientists here, sometimes we're working with a large data set, and we'll go to a conference, and I'm a database person. I go to the uh, big database conference, and I did this large data set that I ran with on 
oh, I don't know, 100 nodes, and then there's a Google person there that just ran it on a million nodes. Okay, well, I don't look quite as big data as they do. <laughs> um, so it would be nice to have access to a lot of these big data infrastructures that maybe universities can't build on their own. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully the, the, the government open data can help you right. know, be a, so, a solution for that. Because what we found at IBM oftentimes is we're out searching for big data to share with other people. Because we get this question, especially from schools, all the time. And the reality is most businesses are not willing to part with it. So there, you know, there, are, there have been occasions where I've seen working examples, like uh, some of the people I talked to earlier this week at VCU, where they partner with a local business and then they set up in a relationship with that local business so the students get access to their data, but it's still kind of firewalled off. Mm -hmm. now, that model can help and you know, help to create those synergies. But again, that requires you know, the university to, you know, to think a little bit outside the box and create those local relationships rather than you know, coming to uh, some other like, magical answer to it, right? Sure. So. so what I'm seeing with some of my clients and even some of the firms that I work with is this there is this great interest, there's a lot of learning, it's a lot of keeping up with the technology and innovation. I see um, great increases in the center of excellences, center for analytics being developed at various organizations. I think certainly there could be an opportunity over there for uh, academic groups and industry to team together and jointly uh, you know, work on solving various problems, uh, including sharing knowledge. Um, same way, same way I know from our standpoint at Deloitte, you know, we have teamed up with several universities where we have a resource pool, we have uh, experts that we reach out to um, in order to you know, help us brainstorm through. And in fact, it might be a client problem, it might be a problem that we're looking to you know, lead from the front on and come up with a solution first. So certainly there are opportunities even over there. So this is related to the last question, but thinking more internally to your companies. So you must bring in, this is an assertion, you, you must bring in new staff that have some skills relevant to the analytics uh, positions they're, they're uh, taking on, but need other skills. How are you handling that problem right now of, of uh, bringing them up to speed? Sure, so um, speaking for, for my team in Deloitte, uh, you know, we look for t talent that have got great background, great experiences, but the most important thing is fantastic potential. So students who have got a wide variety of skills, you know, we're happy to take people with the English background and with a wide variety of and other. And electrical engineering. And electrical <laughs> engineering, you know, <laughs> that's, that's key on our list. Um, and what we do is we have a boot camp program where as students come in, we send them, we make that in, you know, investment right up front where we have a three to four week program where we take uh, campus hires that come into our, into our team and put them through this program where they go through various technology, consultative, industry, analytics, skill, pro programs where you, you get a very good foundation, but again, it also helps strength, you know, build upon the strengths that you do bring in. So that's one of the initial programs that we invest in. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't have a lot to add. IBM does very much the same things, and I know that you know, many of our new grads who will go in will end up, in, in, the, in the consulting side, will end up with quite a few weeks of training before they're put on any assignments, um, as, as much as three months, I've heard, so. Frank? Uh, anybody here belong to the INFORMS organization? Anybody? A few of you. Okay. Uh, some of you may be aware that INFORMS has just introduced the Certified Analytics Professional. How many of you have heard of that? Just a few of you. Well, you may want to actually go out there and do a, a Google search on that. Uh, so this is a new certification program uh, that has been introduced by the INFORMS Professional Society to encourage more analytics professionals. Uh, it's a broad-based uh, uh, training, uh, and uh, if you go through and, do, and you study on your own, but you can then take the test given by INFORMS at local, it'll be in Washington, I think this summer in July, uh, but though it'll be around the country, and it gives you the capability to say that you're a certified analytics professional, 
we and IBM are encouraging our people to train for that, uh, not necessarily become certified, although we'd certainly like that, uh, just like we'd like them to all have uh, MBAs with a data decision or, or you know, analytics background, uh, but we're encouraging people to move in that direction. Uh, we do a lot of internal training as well. We have something called BAO University, which takes people that are incoming uh, to our organization and helps to train them on not only general analytics and data processes, but also the specifics of what's in IBM's portfolio, what's in our toolbox that we use when we go out and do consulting uh, to public uh, as well as private companies. Great, great. So I think it might be fun, is it okay if we open this up? Uh, to uh, the audience to uh, ask any question you want of these fine minds. Jen, we have someone all ready to go. Right behind, behind you. you. Uh, I'm Mike Nelson. I'm an adjunct professor here at Georgetown in the Communications, Culture, and Technology program. I also write for Bloomberg Government, and I used to be an executive at IBM. The statistic that was mentioned in, the, in your opening comments that everybody hears is 140,000 data scientists will be needed. That's important, but you had the more important statistic, which is that 1.5 million managers who understand what the data scientists are saying will need to be trained in the next four years. So I want to focus on how we educate those people, because they're not going to be going to school. They're 40 and 50-year-olds who are already in the workplace, they're already managing teams, making strategic decisions, and often they have no clue about data science. I was lucky, I was a geophysicist, so I knew a little bit about data, but even at IBM, most of the people around me didn't really have the analytic tools. So I'd like to explore how we can develop education programs. Maybe it's just one class for the executive to take when he or she is in her 40s and 50s so that she, so she doesn't make really stupid decisions. Uh, David Brooks just wrote a column about dataism and the fact that we are seeing stupid decisions already. So let's get specific. I, I, as a professor, I give out reading lists. I do case studies. Tell me one book that I should have these executives read. And if you can't think of a book, tell me one good example of a really bad decision that got made because of bad data analytics or worse managers who didn't understand data. So those are kind of two questions. Or three, maybe. Three. <laughs> I was so, still working on the first one. So why don't you answer whatever question you want, but don't identify what question you're answering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, I, whoever, I can talk yeah. about what, you know, what IBM is specifically doing. So we're partnering with universities like Georgetown, and, in some, and, and we're having dis discussions in a, in a lot of different dimensions. In some cases, it's executive education. So some of the schools that we're working with are preparing ed executive education programs, you know, relatively short ones, to be able to come in and get a deeper training, not a course, but you know, a, a sequence of things that an, an executive at any age can go back and get. But we're also partnering with the American Management Association, and we'll be announcing something with them later this year, a series of courses that are exactly what you're talking about, right? Not, not really in-depth, not quarter-long things, but two, three-day things across a number of important topics that will start addressing these issues and allowing people that have been in the workforce for some time to start building these skills without having to start over and go back to university. And I'll add to that. Uh, so this morning, actually just before this meeting, I was on a course, I was on a conference call with what we call our, our analytics ambassadors. These are people within IBM, within our line of business, that are supposed to evangelize eating our own dog food, using analytics uh, on ourselves. Uh, and I'll just give you, you know, one example of, of us doing that, uh, Mike. Uh, we, uh, like every other company, are concerned about attrition because you get good skills and, and then you quickly lose them. So some of our IBM research folks uh, in the uh, analytics field, uh, actually did a study for our uh, India uh, branch uh, looking at people that were leaving. And just like you have a credit score, they built a uh, attrition score, a prediction of who was going to be leaving the company. And they could do a model 
Uh, and then they had to develop interventions, and they did a series of experiments. If I gave this person a bonus and they had a score of 700, you know, would they then stay around? And you could then model whether you know, that intervention worked or not. Uh, and so we've got a whole series of things in the selling community, uh, in the you know, workforce, the HR department uh, community, and our supply chain department that are all evangelizing the use of data and data analytics. They got a curriculum uh, that's supposed to be self-done that's something like 10 pages long and probably is about 400 hours worth of training. I have no idea you know, how we'll get it all in. But uh, the, the listing is, is probably publicly available. A lot of the resources are internal. Um, and I'll answer your other question about a book. Uh, the number one book that I use internally is really to evangelize the need of using data analytics and that's the Moneyball book. And I think I talked to Betsy's class about that, right? Because that talks about the need and the value of doing it. And if you can get, mo you can motivate the people, then they'll then do the training so that they can start utilizing it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me give you the bad example that I heard on the radio last week. Uh, a big data evangelist who said, uh, big data will allow us to move away from having to think of the cause of different outcomes because we'll have such rich correlational structures that we can act on that. And as an example, he said, I have discovered that orange cars last longer than any other color. And I don't have to understand why that's the case anymore, but I can tell all of the listening <laughs> audience, if you're in the market for a used car, it should be orange. <laughs> Buy an orange car. And I believe statistics as a field had <laughs> determined why that's a fallacious sort of leap of inference. Other questions? Hi, thank you. It was really interesting. I'm Gloria Wren from Loyola. Uh, I'd like to turn the question a little bit to research. Uh, we have students that are involved in different research things, and say at the macro level, at the large level, we talk about big data, but in actuality, we have difficulty performing a lot of those characteristics. And so I'm interested in what you think are sort of the unsolved problems that still need to be solved in the big data field. One of the examples that I'll give is one that Lisa talked about. You talked about this, the idea, as I understood it, that we could look at approaches, we could sort of categorize problems according to approach, that that'd be novel and it'd be quite a contribution to a way to approach big data as a field. So I'm interested in your viewpoints in that. Anybody want that one? Yeah, no, I think that's a fun one, I think, because the reality Go that ahead, you wanted to jump in was. Okay, it looks like everybody wants yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, like, you know, we talked about earlier that you know, this type of thing applies to almost every field, you know, but I spend most of my time talking in the, in the context of specific fields. So I think certain areas like machine learning is still has a long ways to go in terms of not only you know advancing the, the the art, but also into making it a lot easier to apply, because right now it's it's so hyper specialized. I think there's going to be opportunity to make that something that can be made more broadly available. So that's that's one example. Another example I would push at would be when you start talking about the the social and ethical implications of what we're doing. I think there's huge opportunity to address that at the academic level and to start, you know, maybe even at the information sciences level to think about, if I take these five data sources and put them together, what does that mean, right? And, and what, am I gonna be violating somebody's privacy? Am I going to be starting off a firestorm I didn't expect by releasing that data in, in that way? I think there's lots of issues that we could start involving philosophy departments and information sciences departments. I mean, a lot of library science programs have re reinvented themselves as information sciences. And you know, I think those schools have a lot to offer and start bringing what they think together and start ontology research, right? I mean, it's not just meta, ontology is a term that got co-opted. So if anybody had heard of that term before, you thought, oh, that's metaphysics. What? So but it's now been co-opted to mean about the relationships of things and to, you know, the semantic web. And there's so many different dimensions at play here that 
that there's a lot of work and a lot of almost anybody involved could find an angle that applies. So one, uh, I think about data a lot. I'm a data mining database person. I mean, data is kind of my life. Um, and I think one area of research that could emerge from a field like data science and big data is the evolution of the data. So what I mean by that is if I'm in English, there's, there's a project at Stanford where there's an English professor who um, gives his students 1,200 books to read. Now, obviously, they're not going to read 1,200 books, but what he's done is he's changed his course so that instead of understanding in depth one or two classic types of, of readings, what he's trying to do is teach them the evolution of certain types of literary style. And I think we can see in many different fields how the evolution of data could be really important, whether it's the evolution of ideas, culture, other, in, in so many things in different fields. So I think as a fundamental research problem, understanding how to measure this evolution, how to, how to identify it, how to figure out um, what it means when something is evolving, what the different structures and processes are associated with it, could be a very, very interesting, challenging research field. Sure. One area that I feel, you know, certainly um, is getting attention but needs more is in the area of video analytics. You know, there is so much information out there being collected. Um, you know, one challenge I've heard of is, you know, the U.S. government has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hours of information, particularly collected through uh, drones um, in the Middle East. Um, being able to make use of it, being able to make accurate use of that information, identifying perhaps, you know, a tree versus a human a, versus a face of somebody who may, you might be interested in. And similarly, you know, even on the commercial or civilian side, looking at video information to do analytics and perhaps combine that with predictive analytics to make, um, you know, actionable insights. I think that's one area that's not been fully tapped and it certainly is an emerging area. Frank. So, and I'll give you another example uh, to link with that, uh, and that's the area of, of healthcare analytics. Uh, everybody here saw Watson uh, in the Jeopardy game, the Je Jeopardy challenge, I hope. If you didn't, it's out there on YouTube. Uh, you can do video analytics, as Satish said, and, and learn about it. Uh, so uh, now the question for IBM and, and really society is how do you build a system that does question answering not for a game like Jeopardy, uh, but for a field like uh, healthcare, right? And so can you build a system that can take in all the knowledge that exists uh, and then turn it into something that's useful for answering questions? And that's a big research problem. The problem uh, that we're seeing is that doctors on, in general don't have the time to read all the latest journals to stay up with all the clinical trials and all the results, and therefore they're constrained. If you could, can you build a system that can do what we've been talking about as information alchemy? Remember alchemy from whatever junior high or something, right? Uh, turning uh, base, uh, you know, coal or base metals into gold. Well, now the question is, can you take all this information that's out there and turn it into knowledge? and then turn it into wisdom if you want to go farther than that, right? Um, and that's a real challenge. It's a real research problem uh, that schools are starting to look at, is how do we take all of this information that's out this, there? Betsy talked about all the you know, petabytes and, and zettabytes of data that are coming, and how do you get those kind of insights, that kind of knowledge uh, out of that so we can make key decisions? Great. These are great questions. Yeah, I think you were next. Hi, I'm Jose Guerrero from Business School. I teach data mining and stats. And the question in this particular case would be cultural resistance and big data. What we are seeing in this particular moment in the United States, I think we are ready to accept big data in many ways. But recently, for example, yesterday, there was an article in the Le Monde in France showing how important big data and data <coughs> mining was. Is it possible that internationally, even though that we believe in big data and the citizens believe in big data, 
referred to what Stephen said with respect to privacy. Do you think there's some cultural resistance around the world? Not to the data is going to be there, the big data, but the analysis and which way the citizen, the citizen would take advantage of it. So I think, I think there is a lot of resistance to big data. I think there's, uh, but I, I do believe that it's generational. Uh, I think that um, younger students and children who have grown up with access to any type of data that they want and desire feel very comfortable with data being out there and sharing it and sharing a little too much of it, frankly, but, um, but doing that and not thinking about the privacy implications of it. I think those of us who kind of grew up in an era where there was a little less data about us all around really hesitate and, and are very concerned about privacy. Um, I am personally am very concerned about privacy and, and my poor two kids, I mean, must have heard every privacy lecture in the world about their data <laughs> being out on the web. So, um, so I, I don't know that I think it's as much cultural as I do think that it has to do with generation. Yeah, well, we are seeing some cultures that are being, you know, quite trading the problem quite differently. I'll use the Chinese as a more extreme example, right? They're, if, you, if you're there and you want to use Facebook or you want to use Twitter, you got to be pretty creative to get around the Great Firewall of China. And, you know, so they're creating their, some of their own internally, but even then the government clamps down on a lot of what we would consider open exchange of things. So you have that problem, and I, like you saw in France and other countries, there's a little bit of concern. We, you know, France has a lot of, you know, con issues with a lot of different things right now that they're, you know, they're, they're going to have to wrestle with and solve, right? It's not, certainly not just this one. Um, so I think, you know, the generational part, I think that's a tidal wave that eventually the whole world's going to change along with it. Just some, some places will just take time. So definitely, you know, time is one aspect, generations. And also, you know, another aspect would be is, you know, actually having that business case. Um, I mean, I can, you know, I recall a project that we did a few years ago, which really was a big global investigation into uh, corruption, bribery, um, and a whole range of other issues. And, you know, it touched upon Europe and a lot of personal information, healthcare information, doctors, credit cards, linking finances, terror threats. Um, I mean, there was a deep business case and we had done this work with the backing of the, U the United Nations. So certainly that gave us access to the information, gave us access to the data, and the results of that was essentially published in a UN report on you know, the bad actors. So certainly having a business case does help um, you know, in, in breaking through these barriers. I'll be very brief. Uh, so I think it's a question of the value that you get out of the big data versus a disadvantage. So if, I'm, if I have a heart attack, uh, you know, I want my geolocation to be known and I don't care about privacy at that point, right? Uh, and there was one app, uh, Vivek's gone, but that, that the government data Palooza that, you know, if someone's having a heart attack, you could, there's an app that you can turn it on and it will locate everybody with a CPR, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, certification, right? right um, that are within, you know, a mile of you because every second is precious. And so if they can locate these people that have the capability to do CPR on you, you want them to show up instantly. And you'll trade you know, privacy to get that sort of thing. But it is a slippery slope. I mean, as one who advocates privacy in the context of data mining, I think it is very important to let people have their sphere around them and maintain that sphere um, of privacy. So there was a hand here and a hand here. So I think you're, sir, yeah, you're next. Okay, a few minutes ago, several of you, in fact, all of you, emphasized the importance of asking the right question. And at VCU, we put together a curriculum, and we have a whole course in there based on that. And at the moment, I haven't the slightest idea what to put in that class <laughs> or no idea of how to teach it or what we're going to teach or how you teach, quote, asking the right questions. Now, I have till next summer to figure it out, but I'm hoping <laughs> I can do it today. Would you comment on how you either teach or aid or support people to learn to, quote, ask the right question? I, I think what we should now do is say, 
that is the right question. Next question. <laughs> 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 who, who wants to? I would ask Watson, because I don't have a clue on that one. <laughs> That was too hard of a question. Yeah, so I, so I'd say, you know, it's an, <laughs> it's an iterative process. I think, you know, for me, you know, when, I, when I'm meeting with clients, when I'm meeting with government executives, I gather a lot of data. I study a lot of information. I, um, there's a lot of homework that you need to do to understand the issues, understand the problem, understand the people understand the industry, gather that information, and then ask questions. I think asking questions right up front and saying, okay, here's a, prob here's a problem, or you know, trying to define a problem and then straight away shooting questions out, I think that can be dangerous. It's almost as though you need to do some initial data analysis, and you know, if you look at the CRISP framework of uh, mm -hmm. um, modeling, you, know, it's, you, know, you understand the problem, you speak to folks who are knowledgeable about it. Uh, again, when you speak, it's not just asking questions, it's listening. It's give it an open, give them an open forum and say, what's on your mind? So I, I actually think the answers were <coughs> given earlier in different words, and that is that the, uh, you know, you can think of data as having no value at all without a user. So the user brings value to the data really by posing questions to the data that the data can answer. And um, those questions, I guess I sort of bought into the philosophy announced here earlier, those questions require domain knowledge uh, about the data. If you don't have the domain knowledge, you will, you will fool yourself that you're asking important questions, I think. Now sometimes you can steal questions from one domain, apply them to another, and get away with it quite well. Uh, but it, I'm, I've sort of bought into the knowledge you can't just be a, a data analyst without knowing anything other than data and be a good one. Yeah. If I can answer so, that question. This, yeah, okay. I, answer, uh, I thought you worked for Georgetown. I still teach one class a term here okay, at Georgetown. Okay. I'm, I'm no longer full time. But at Bloomberg Government, we actually brought in the CIA to help us answer this question. And they've done some very interesting open source documents on the trade craft of, analyst, uh, of analysis. And they use this to train their own analysts to make sure they're not being deceived by the data, make sure they're seeing the whole picture. And uh, I, I'd recommend that as another source of, of good references. Yeah, one thing I was going to say is oftentimes um, in working at IBM, uh, when an executive comes in and, and, and makes a, a statement, yeah, I need you to go do this, and then people run off and start doing it without actually stepping back and asking questions and trying to get to the underlying root problem. Um, oftentimes you never know what the exact, what's going to result from that type of behavior. So I think in, when I build, if I was to build a course, I would start with so, so maybe with a, some real examples of you know, so just putting the class to work. And don't, ask, don't start by asking questions or teaching them how to ask questions, but just get them to realize you know, what goes wrong if you jump to conclusions too fast or you look at something and all of a sudden the class is interacting and talking about it and you get some really interesting results. Then you maybe fold in some data okay, and then how does that change where you would go? And then you know, they started asking, okay, now what, and then they started, all started asking questions. Now what other data could I get? What other things could I bring together? And I think over a course, you could you know, take kids from looking at things in a, whatever way they were to a much more open mind about knowing what they need to do to bring all the things together before they can really you know, go to that next level and, and make the right decisions or better decisions than they were. Let me just add one thing to that, if I could. And that is, if you do mount this course, I, I hope you have a component that sensitizes the students to data quality, to be skeptical about data and never trust them until you they've really proven themselves yeah. to. Yeah. My question is, has um, been discussed just right now, but I want to follow up. Uh, my name is Phoebe Sharkey, and I'm also from Loyola. Um, 
I have real concerns about the, the danger of quick dissemination of bad analytics. And I say that in specific reference to one of the comments the keynote speaker made to today, and that was how excited he was about an app that was developed from CMS data that, to that, that told patients which hospitals had the highest mortality rates. Um, that same question was dealt with back in the early 1980s by the Healthcare Financing Administration, um, and they, they published, of all 5,000 hospitals in the United States, those hospitals with the highest mortality rates, um, but their model was flawed. And there was subsequent research done at Hopkins that showed that they were not taking into account patient severity of illness. So hospitals they had labeled as killer hospitals were really best practice hospitals. They were saving more patients than you would expect because patients came into those hospitals uh, with the highest severity of illness. And if, if an app developer out there is developing these um, applications to inform the public and is, is giving such bad information to the public. CEOs and C CFOs of, of killer hospitals were, were being fired based on the original data that was published and it, it took three or four years before research proved those models incorrect and, those, and HICFA had to withdraw them. So how do we protect against against the dissemination of really dangerous data that's flawed and, and produces consequences that, yeah. that are, are wrong. Yeah. So, so let me I give you something. We shouldn't go to a hospital where sick people go. That's <laughs> what is it? So, so let me give you a best practice that we've seen, and I'll actually use the Census Bureau since Bob and Betsy and, and my wife uh, all used to work there. Um, and that is that they actually have a center of excellence or center of competence around statistics. And while my wife was an expert at housing, she wasn't an expert at statistics. So every time she had to do a report or analysis is sort of similar to what you were referring to, it had to go through this math stat organization, the mathematical statisticians, who was this center of excellence that made sure that she was correctly using statistics. We all know statistics can lie, right? And so it really does require this approach that says that you know, general people, you know, may know the problem, uh, and they may try to use data and statistics correctly, but you really need to validate this with the real experts. And I know NIST, NIST, uh, has a similar uh, group of, of math stats, uh, and I suspect many other, uh, I don't know about private industry, but many other uh, agencies actually have these uh, centers of excellence. I think the simplest, I shouldn't say it's simple, but the, the best way to address this is simply to raise the skill level of everybody, right? So if we're all looking at this stuff skeptically and the people that are doing peer reviews of this data before it gets released have higher levels of skill, you know, you're going to lower the incidence of bad stuff going out. I don't think you'll ever eliminate it. I, 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 we see it all the time just in the popular press, people putting out stuff and then the next three days, people attack it and go after it and then they prove this is why you did this wrong. So there is this, there is a bit of a tendency in some cases to try to do this quick. Oh, this is, this is gonna be sensational, this is gonna be fun. And you don't realize the backlash that's coming. I think we're all gonna learn uh, iteratively through this. But it's, it will take you know, time to build the skills of, and across the board so that everybody can look at the information critically and think about the context, right? You know, because yeah, firing people, you know, without actually even sitting back and thinking about what that data really meant, right? You know, because in a lot of cases, I bet some of those hospitals were in poor areas or other things where people didn't have regular health care and they showed up at the last minute when it was almost too late to save them, right? So you can have lots of things that could skew results in unfavorable ways, and you have to take all those into consideration. Yeah. And, and, you know, hearing you speak, uh, you know, certainly does reflect upon um, having more educated consumers of the data. Looking at those results with, and asking those questions, you know, how, you know, how could this, you know, as a consumer of the data itself say, 
how is this developed? Is there enough information here? Should I rely upon this data? I think being a consumer of information also, I think that's where, from an education standpoint, getting people um, you know, up to that level was very important. So uh, one point to be made, a lot of information that comes out is actually descriptive information. So the fact that the mortality rate is high at a particular hospital or that there's more doctors in one area at a particular hospital or there's fewer ambulances, if we use that as descriptive information, it's just a fact or a point. But if we use that for prediction, when it was never meant for prediction, that's, I think, where we're getting um, on a slippery slope. So we have to teach people the descriptive data that comes from either data mining or other, other types of apps or wherever they're coming from. It's descriptive. It's characterizing the data. It's giving it kind of a definition. But it doesn't need to be used for prediction, and you can't immediately use it for prediction unless you build certain models and, and you analyze the data in a more sophisticated way. So I'm afraid our fearless leader is telling us that we must stop. And uh, so I'll turn it over to Betsy. Yeah. end is better education so and that's what this conference has been about so I want to thank um, Bob for moderating Satish Steve Lisa and Frank for um, being part of a very interesting panel and thank you everyone today we have little gifts for you before you leave um, but please feel free to stay around and network and thank you so much uh, thank you.